So when I first started making jewelry, uh, there was this jewelry shop in uh, downtown San Luis Obispo I used to like to go to. Uh, it wasn't a traditional jewelry shop, it was actually a consignment based uh, estate jewelry shop, meaning that everything there had been pre-owned, uh, which meant it was a really eclectic mix of jewelry and gemstones. The reason I used to go there is because the owner was also a gemologist, so I would bring him stones uh, that I wanted uh, to have identified, and he would take them and then tell me what they were, charge me $10, $20 or so, um, and I would uh, meanwhile walk around the shop and look at all of his jewelry and gemstones and everything like that, um, but I never actually had the opportunity to see his entire inventory of loose stones. But now, uh, he went out of business a few years ago, retired, uh, happily, after having done jewelry for many decades, and he sold his entire collection to another local collector who I am uh, friends with. That collector then gave me the opportunity to look through all of these trays of gemstones and handpick out a few that I wanted to buy for my own collection. So I've done that. Uh, there are about 27 trays here, including both jewelry and loose stones. And of these 27 trays, uh, and tens of thousands of stones, I picked 16 for myself, mostly opals. Uh, if, you, if you subscribe to my channel, you know I'm kind of a sucker for opals. So I'll show you those stones a little bit later, but for now I just wanted to talk a little bit about what I have here, um, how to get a hold of this collector if you want to purchase any of these trays or loose stones, and a little bit about um, how things like this come to pass. All right, before I go too much further into this video, I do want to take a moment to thank uh, my sponsor for this one. Um, I Love Rocks, who loaned me this collection uh, so that I could take a look at it and also gave me permission to go ahead and shoot a video. If you want to get in contact with them uh, to either learn more about these or to purchase some of them, You'll want to get a hold of Santos, and his contact information is going to be posted here. There's his website and his email address. So go ahead and give them a, a message if you're interested. Um, but now, on to this collection. So, uh, like I said, this came from my retired jeweler. And what happens is if you're a jeweler and you retire, unless you have a huge going out of business sale and somehow manage to sell off all your inventory, you're left with a bunch of gemstones. So you have to do something with them, and most of the time what they do is they get liquidated to large collectors, like I Love Rocks, who buys up an entire estate collection and then slowly sells it off to jewelers like myself, um, collectors, uh, or uh, retail buyers. So I'll kind of go over real quick what we have here, and then later I'll show you what I picked out and why I picked them. So the thing about this collection that I really liked was that some of the things in this collection are items that are really hard to find. And a great example of that is some of the opals. What I like to buy opals, I like to be able to see them in person whenever possible. And because many people are now online sellers, it makes it really difficult to be able to buy stones like these opals without seeing them at first in person. So having a collection here means I get to handpick what I want and then present it to my buyers using videos online or with in-person appointments. But I wanted to briefly show you a few items which I thought were notable that you really can't find very many other places. Okay, so this case is my favorite, and here's why. It's almost all opals, specifically Australian opals, which I really prefer over any other type. Um, now, one thing I do want to make clear is that actually a lot of these are triplets. Now, triplets are still in high demand, especially high-quality triplets like these. These stones have a lot of color play in them. 
and are calibrated to stones, meaning they'll fit most pre-made mountings. When you look at triplets, you want to look for stones like these that have a lot of red in them. There's different types of triplets as well. These triplets here are made using thin slices of opal. They have an onyx backing and usually a clear quartz cap. And you can see that when you look at them in the side and on the back. The backs are almost always white or black. And if you look at the side, you'll see a transparent dome top. These ones right here and these are called mosaic triplets. You can see they're actually made using little tiny pieces of opal laid out in a mosaic. These will also have a onyx backing. They're generally not domed though, however, they're generally very flat, sometimes with an epoxy coating on the top. Now my favorites are these over here. These mosaics have opal inlaid into onyx in beautiful patterns. Here we have a rose and a hummingbird. Here's a bird of paradise among some flowers. A swan. This is a beautiful butterfly. And these stones all have really good color play. Also, all made with small mosaics of natural opal. Okay, so mosaics like these uh, are actually difficult to find. They are available online, but generally these are all vintage pieces here, so you're not going to see a lot of them. The rest of the stones in here, we have some smaller calibrated uh, opals from Australia. These are some boulder opal doublets. Uh, some of them are assembled and some of them are just naturally doublets, meaning that they naturally have a ironstone backing. Generally you can tell by looking at them if the seam is perfectly straight all the way across and all the way around, it means it's an assembled doublet. If it's jagged or rough going around, it means that it's a natural boulder opal that simply has a large area of color play that was cut across the surface. These here are Mexican opals. This specific type of opal is called a Kinturit opal. It usually means that there is a large area of fire opal that was cut in a cabochon with a lot of the matrix kept around the opal. Trays like these are really common in a jewelry shop. They call these breakout trays, or at least that's what I call them. Oftentimes, jeweler will take in a piece for melt and remove all the small stones. Later he'll be able to use them uh, when making repairs on other jewelry. So this, this particular tray has a large collection of emeralds, really small emeralds, that would be great for using in repairs of older estate emerald jewelry. It also has some beautiful citrine pieces and some nice custom cuts that you generally can't just buy from online catalogs. They're not going to carry stones like this. This tray here has dozens of little parcels of oval sapphires as well as a few nice willow opals. These opals like this one are from Ethiopia. This happens to be a smoked Ethiopian opal which is what gives it its dark color. These are all natural Ethiopian opals. 
which have no treatment whatsoever. Given the age of this collection, I would wager that all of these opals are quite stable, so if they're not cracked now, they're not likely to crack later. But with any Ethiopian opal, you do of course want to be careful with how it might interact with water and soap over time, so that it doesn't lose its color. So one thing I actually like about this collection is that knowing that it came from a gemologist, he has ID'd almost every stone in the collection. And I feel relatively confident that if he's labeled something as a certain stone, that that's exactly what it is. Uh, so he's also separated out authentic stones from imitation stones, from CZs, lab created. A lot of the stones are very easy to identify. For example, this tiger eye. Other things you can tell have been pulled out of old estate things, estate rings, like these pieces here. This is an old onyx inlay for a ring, as well as this piece of synthetic spinel, which would have been popular probably during the 20s or 30s. Somebody probably brought that in, melted down the ring, and the jeweler removed the stone. You have trays like this which have all sorts of stones that might have been removed from old jewelry. Here the jeweler just threw together a collection of jade, as well as some other jade stones. Some older turquoise, some of which have started to have a green luster to them, which were probably removed from some old rings. Some beautiful onyx carvings. These would have probably been part of a handsome men's ring or maybe a lady's pendant. This one has a Trojan soldier on it, which was a popular carving. There are also some really nice black Tahitian pearls here. These are Baroque pearls. Not Baroque, Baroque. Meaning that they are not round but are kind of a fancy shape. And these are actually abnormally large for their size and would fetch a really nice price on the open market. You get to see here's a little collection of little babbles, which were probably removed from a pendant of some kind. Maybe the jeweler had wanted to make earrings out of them, but never got around to it. A piece of jade here with a prong set ruby set in it. Kind of an unusual piece. So if big colorful stones are your thing, then these are the trays that might interest you. This tray is almost all amethyst, and most of these stones are over 10 carats. They all have really good color, and because they have been kept indoors in trays, then none of them are faded. And it's important to remember that quartz and amethyst, especially other stones like kyanite, Topaz aquamarine can fade if left in the direct sun for long periods of time. This tray has some beautiful blue topazes. Also, most of these are 10 carats or larger. It would make fantastic pendants or, or rings. This one here that particularly caught my eye is a beautiful deep purple color. LS is this really gorgeous citrine. Stones like this are hard to find. So that's the collection now. Did I buy myself some goodies? You bet I did. 16 stones is what I found in that entire collection that I myself was willing to uh, pay, pay up front for. Um, I don't have buyers for any of these, but I really liked them. And um, I'm going to be putting them together here to make some jewelry. So I'll kind of show you what I acquired and uh, why I like it. All right, so of the 16 stones I got, uh, 11 are opals and five are not. This topaz is one I picked out just because of the cut. Look at that thing. I've never seen a topaz cut like that before. So because this isn't something I can just order off of a catalog or online any old time I feel like it, I decided that one was worth taking. These two are both turquoise. The uh, type of turquoise is not labeled, but with some online research I think I'll be able to figure out where they came from. This one I got simply because it has a beautiful blue color. It's nice and thick, 
and I know it will make a handsome ring. This one, I'm going to do some more research on. I believe it's Lander Turquoise. If it is, that actually makes it fairly valuable. Lander Turquoise is from a mine that no longer produces, and it's known for its telltale little tiny pockets of turquoise with mostly matrix. So that's this this uh, pattern here is highly desirable, and if it's true Lander, uh, it will be worth quite a bit. Um, but since I don't know for sure, I'm going to just call it Nevada Turquoise, since I believe that's where it came from. And uh, I don't want to misrepresent it, since I don't actually have the provenance to prove where it came from. These two stones I simply got because I liked them. This one is a jade carving. It's difficult to see what it actually is, but uh, I like the way it was laid out. I might inlay, uh, inlay some diamonds in these holes, or little droplets of gold. This one was labeled as chrysoprase. However, anyone that knows chrysoprase knows that it probably is not chrysoprase. More than likely, it's uh, going to be chrysocolla, or if I'm lucky, gem silica. It does have a little bit of translucence to it. So that's encouraging. And I'm going to make a nice signet ring for this out of this one. So I'll make a nice men's ring with this on the top. It's a good ring size. And that's one of the things I also look for is if it's a good good size for a ring. I intend on making it for a man or a woman. Square cut and rectangular cut stones like this tend to be very more much more masculine. So I plan on making this as a men's ring. Uh, these ones are a little more unisex. I could make a man's or ladies ring out of these. This topaz right here will make a beautiful lady's ring or pendant. Now for the opals, which if you subscribe to my channel, you know that's kind of one thing I really, really love. And I have 11 stones here that I acquired. Oh, I just realized, okay, this one's not an opal. This is actually a fire I get. but it's a beautiful stone nonetheless. It actually reminds me of a beetle. It has two little segments, a little front part, and then two back parts that, where the color splits in the back, so I might make a little beetle-inspired ring. The rest of these here, these 10 stones are all opals. And I have these two, which are both Cantera opals from Mexico. I got them because they're well-shaped and they have excellent play of color. The precious opal it is in, in there. This one is called a jelly opal. It might look like an Ethiopian, but this is actually a jelly opal. These usually come from Mexico, but occasionally from Australia. I'll need to do a little more research in order to determine the exact location. But jelly opals like this have uh, are generally transparent and have beautiful color play within them. In order to be a true jelly opal, it has to be both transparent and have some color play in it. So this stone will be difficult to sell without a video because uh, taking photographs of jelly opals is really difficult. This is another jelly opal. This one is a carving. This one is obviously a Mexican opal. This really one of the only places where you can get orange fire jelly opals. So because of the carving, it makes it difficult to see the color play in the stone, but it does exhibit a small amount of color play. Color play oftentimes can get hidden behind the orange tone of the stone, but you can see some green fire in there. The thing that I liked about it is it, again, about statement ring size or pendant size. It will look excellent in 18 karat yellow gold, and it is completely polished across all of the surfaces, so I don't need to retouch the stone at all. Which is great because I don't really do carving. It's important to know what you do and what you don't do. Okay, so these two are something that I've never worked in much before. These are both triplets. Australian opal triplets to be exact. But I got them because most of the triplets you see online are pretty poor quality. And in order to find a triplet of this caliber, usually you're looking at a few hundred dollars. This is a larger stone, and it has a full spectrum of color play. 
every color in the rainbow from red all the way through purple. It's very attractive, there's no dead spots. So it's everything that you look for in a high quality opal triplet. This one I got for many of the same reasons. It's not quite as good. You can see it has some graying here along the edges. So the slice of opal they used in this one was just not quite as high a quality as the other slice. But it still has wonderful color play and it has a different type of patterning in it, which might be attractive to different people since opals really are one of those stones that beauty is in the eye of the beholder. These two are both Australian. This is something you don't see every day. Somebody decided to take a bowler opal. Now some people might call this an opal doublet, however if you look around the edge you can see that it is not an assembled doublet. It is simply natural opal that formed on top of the ironstone matrix and they kept most of the matrix in order to keep the opal thick enough in order to be able to use in jewelry. This one does have a tiny nick right here which I'll need to, to sand off and then repolish but it's set in a nice attractive square shape and it has good color play. This stone I, I acquire simply because it is a nice round shape and sometimes I have orders that require a nice round Australian opal and ordering from catalogs is unreliable as you never really know what you're going to get but at least with this one I know that it has color play, I know what size it is, and I have it on hand. This opal is a bit of a sleeper meaning that its color play is rather faint to the casual eye if you just have it sitting here on the table it mostly looks cloudy but when you start playing with it you can see it has some really nice color bands. The reason why it's not as bright as it could be is you can see that the color band here, if you look at the back of the stone, is actually facing this direction, perpendicular to the cut. So in an ideal world, the stone actually would have been cut this direction. Uh, however, the cutter, for one reason or another, chose to cut it a different way, and that's fine. Oftentimes, as a cutter, you don't have a choice. Perhaps there was a crack in the stone that ran along this face, or, or other problems that presented it, uh, themselves as a cutter worked. But this was more than likely some sort of knobby opal from Australia. And it has really good color play for this type and size. So I'm going to enjoy working with that one for sure. The last one I got is this one here, which I think will make a really nice either a ladies black opal engagement ring or a men's ring. I love the colors in this one. I know that reds and purples and oranges are more valuable. Um, perhaps it's because I'm a guy, but I just love the blue tones in opals, even though they're not as, as valuable as the reds. This stone has beautiful color play. It has a rough cut surface on the side and on the back, so I might go through and polish it a little bit myself. The surface is also not quite as glossy as I would like, and I think if I hit it with some uh, half micron diamond grind, uh, polishing paste, uh, I can get it to pop a little more. Uh, there, there's another one of my videos on the channel that goes over how to do this if you have opals that just aren't quite as glossy as you want them to be. Okay, so I think I've droned on for quite a while here about these stones. Again, um, if you want to talk to me about purchasing any of these or having a ring made with them, then please go to my website here. And if you want to talk to I Love Rocks about any of the other things that I found out, please visit their website here. Again, uh, thank you very much for watching and enjoy the rest of your day.